Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through chapter 4, verse 1, page 1167. If you have a pew Bible, would you read along with me today? <clears throat> wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Let's pray. Father, speak to us through your word today. Enlarge our faith. Enlarge our worldview. And just be present in our lives. Do a work in us that we are not capable of doing on our own. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Ah, here we go, right? <laughs> oh, maybe you didn't read verse 18 with me. Here we go, right? And, and what comes after that? Where are we going to go today? It's, uh, it's fascinating to me. As I was reading through this many times repeatedly this week, um, I can't help but think my initial thought goes to verses that have been abused in ways in the past. Now, we can hold many different opinions upon these verses, but the reason that kept coming to my mind is I kept thinking about Christ's interaction with the Pharisees. And what was Christ's interaction with the Pharisees in the New Testament? So many times, Christ's interaction with the Pharisees was him being very frustrated with them, being very disappointed in them, and even to the point of holy anger, we could call it, with the Pharisees. And the reason that he had that is because the Pharisees took the law, the Old, the Old Testament scriptures, and they used it, and, and we could all say abused it in a way to gain control of people, to get them to act a certain way, to behave a certain way, to elevate themselves while relegating other people. I think you can see the parallel I'm getting at here, right? Verse 18 is a verse that has been used in a similar manner over ways. So where are we going to go with that? And maybe you even don't agree with that statement, and that's okay. So I say let's get into the scripture together and let's work through it. In my opinion, verse 18, let's read it. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Isn't really that controversial if you truly read the verse. You don't pull like a Frank Costanza sh stop short move, right? And maybe you don't know what that is. It's the stop short move. If you're a Seinfeld episode, there's one of, one of my all-time favorite episodes. Um, I can't even tell you the name of the episode, but it, 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 it pertains to an episode where the character Cosmo Kramer gets a vanity license plate in the state of New York that was intended for a man who is a proctologist and not himself. And so the whole episode revolves around that, but it's all about this move, the stop short move. And even if you don't know what the stop short move is, you know what the stop short move is. The stop short move probably happened to you when you were an infant. Well, maybe not my children because they had to sit in the back and ride car seats. But for those of us who actually grew up in an area where we could ride in the front car seat and you didn't have to wear seat belts all the time, if your parent stepped on the brake too hard or somebody pulled out, the stop short move is they would hit the brakes but simultaneously do this with their arm, right? And why would they extend their arm? To keep you from going forward. Now we all know that in an emergency situation that does absolutely jack squat, right? You have very little muscular power when you're trying to, something going, trying to stop something going forward this way. Well, in the Seinfeld episode, it was Frank Costanza's move when he was dating his wife. The stop short move. And I'm not going to get into the logistics of it, but the stop short move, I think you can figure it out. That's what we do with this verse, don't we? We stop short. We read this verse and we go, wives, submit to your husbands. We stop short. We don't finish reading it. But the verse doesn't end there. Because if the verse ended there, I would have a far different interpretation than the one that I'm going to give you today. I would say it could be used for control, but it hasn't. It's been, it's been abused for control. It's been misused for control. It's been misused in, in the church. It's been misused in marriages. 
and it's been misused for personal gain. This verse, hear me say this now, is not about husbands controlling their wives. It's not about, hey, I'm home from work. Would you please massage my feet, get me something to drink, and pull out the recliner for me? Oh, and by the way, turn it to this television station, right, while you're making dinner and feeding the kids. That's not what this verse is about. This, not is a verse, this verse is not about a husband controlling a wife. It's not about her having, him having her do his every whim. Because there's more to it. We can't stop short. We have to keep reading. And it says what? As is fitting in the Lord. How do those words change our perspective on this verse? It's actually a similar concept to what you would find in verse 23 if you would read on. And we're going to address that later. You see, when it says those words, as is fitting in the Lord, all of a sudden the perspective changes. Our worldview opens up a little bit. It's not about doing for something for yourself, but it's about doing something for who? God. For the Lord. You see, we do things differently, or at least maybe even with a different mindset, than when we're doing them to the Lord as opposed to when we're doing them to, them, to ourselves. Let me give you an example. If I were to go out this afternoon uh, and go to the local shooting range and, and shoot my gun, shoot my rifle, the same one I use for deer hunting, I would have a lot of fun because I enjoy that. I think it's a fun activity, um, and I would enjoy it. Now, if I were to do the same activity two days before deer season, do you think my mindset would change a little bit? See, I go out to the range today and shoot for fun. I tried different yardages, different distances, standing, sitting, different situations. And I really wouldn't care a whole lot about the results as long as I was close. But guess what happens two days before deer season? I want that bad boy dialed in on the bullseye. I do not want to miss my opportunity when the big one comes along. There's a different mindset at play there. Right? We do things differently in different circumstances and different situations. When I come home from work, when I come home from the office sometimes and my kids' rooms are clean, it's easy to tell whether my kids cleaned the room because their mother said, you guys will clean your room today. Or we said, hey, we're getting a new piece of furniture, the one you've always wanted. Can you get your room ready so that we're ready to put it in? It's a difference in their mindset and it's a difference in their room, right? The room's going to look the same either way, but do I open up the closet and everything comes tumbling out because they just stuffed it in because their mom told them to, or did they actually clean because they cared about it? Or how about on a missions trip? What I love about missions trips is people do stuff on missions trips that they would never do in daily lives. I volunteer to wash dishes. Sure, I'm on a missions trip. I'm doing it for God. Do I do it at home? I'm just being honest, folks. I hate dishes. But we all do that, right? See, this phrase, as is fitting in the Lord, should change your perspective on how wives are to submit to their husbands and the implications of what this means for the husband. You see, the basic premise is dealing with how we treat one another. Do you treat people as a possession or do you treat them as a person? Do you treat your spouse as a possession or do you treat them as a person? See, let's look at what the Lord says about how we should treat people. There's this instance in the book of Mark, chapter 12, verses 29 through 31. You've heard it before because I probably speak out of this verse or these group of verses almost monthly, if not even more so. Somebody comes to the Lord and says, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus Christ says what? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and... To love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these two. So how are we to treat people? We are to love them as we love ourselves. Matthew chapter 5 verses 44 through 48. Jesus is giving some example of how we are to love people. He said, you've heard it said long ago, this, that, and the other thing. But I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So how are we to love people? We are to love them as Christ told us to love people. Not as our enemies, but even if they are your enemies, you are to love them nonetheless, and you are to pray for them. Pray for the ones who persecute you, Jesus said. In verse 22 of the same chapter, he said, You have heard it said long ago that, that anyone who commits murder is in the dangers of the fires of hell. But I say that anybody who is angry with his brother 
has already committed murder in his heart. If you are angry with someone, it's like committing murder, Christ said. I love what he said in Matthew chapter 18. Whoever humbles himself like a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Do you come across bravado with a big personality in people's faces or do you treat people with the humility of a child? And then in Luke chapter 27, he says to what? He says, did I say chapter 27? Chapter 6, verse 27. Do to others what you would have them do unto you. He goes on to say this. He said, if you love somebody who loves you, what credit is that to you? Even the pagans do that. If you love somebody who loves you, what credit is that to you? Everybody already does that. It's easy to be nice to the people that are being nice to you. But I'm asking for more. But here's what I really want to touch on. I really want to touch on this passage. and You've heard this passage before. It's found in the book of John, chapter 13, verses 5 through 7. I'm going to read it. Jesus, the word of the Lord says this. After that, this is when the disciples and Christ are in the upper room on the Passover meal. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet, and his whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. Here us go. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Did you pick it up? Did you hear what Jesus said? Because if you didn't, I'm going to read it again. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Christ came to serve. Christ came to serve and said, this is what you need to do now. Guess what he didn't do? He didn't come to control. Because of my love for you, this is how you have to be? No, that's not what he said. He said, because of my love for you, I want you to go out and spread that love and serve others. You see, what's fascinating is I can't find anywhere in this book, in my Bible, maybe it says differently in your Bible, although I highly doubt it, anywhere in scriptures, I can't find a verse where it says one person has dominion and should dominate another one in their relationship because of it. It's just not in there. If you find it, let me know. But I don't see it in my scriptures. You see, this, this passage, along with the passage found in Ephesians, has been used and misused and abused in the past. Let me read Ephesians for you, chapter 5, verses 22 through 24. Here's what it says. It says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit, should submit to their husbands in everything. Scott, it says right there, in everything. Maybe you're not getting this passage right, Pastor Scott. Maybe I'm not, but maybe I am. Because similar to the passage that we're talking about in Colossians today, if we just stop reading there, guess what? It's not complete. It's not complete, so let's read a little further in Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, 
cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, <clears throat> in this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are all members of his body. And that's not saying if you are self-abusive that you can then go abuse your wife, right? That's not what Christ is getting at here. That's not what Paul is getting at. See, we tend to bristle at this thought of submission. The idea that someone outside of ourselves um, should have input in our lives. It's a social construct. If you look at our society, anytime you mention the word submission, we go, whoa, 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 hold up the tracks. We view submission as an act that puts one person up here and one person down here. But this is how Christ taught us to live through both his words and actions. There, there's a great example. There's a movie that came out in 2004, and I've used it before, I think. It's, it's called King Arthur. It's a story about Arthur, Arthur and his legendary knights. And at one part of the movie, Arthur is praying by himself in the horse barn. Because him and his knights are going out on a mission. One that's basically, they know they're probably not going to come back from. You see, they should have had their freedom by this point. They should have been decommissioned. They should have been able to do whatever they want to do. But they got to sign one more last mission. It's basically a suicide mission. So Arthur is in the barn praying to God for the strength to lead his men into this mission and into probable and eventual death. While he's praying out loud, Sir Lancelot walks in, hears him. And this is what Lancelot says to Arthur. He says this, Why do you always talk to God and not to me? Pray to whomever you pray that we don't cross the Saxons, their enemy at the time. Arthur says this, he says, My faith is what protects me, Lancelot. Why do you challenge this? Lancelot responds the way many of us would and says this, I don't like anything that puts a man on his knees. To which Arthur replies, No man fears to kneel before a God that he trusts. Without faith, without belief in something, what are we? And I love that line. It's my favorite line from the movie. No man fears to kneel before a God that he trusts. That's exactly what's being stated in Ephesians chapter 5. About how a husband treats his wife. And how a wife should treat her husband. It's exactly what Paul's stating in our passage in Colossians today. Same thing. Wives, submit to your husbands as a fitting Lord. Husbands, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything. For this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. It's not about control, people. That's our initial reaction to this wording, but it's not the ending, so we must read on. If you use the Bible for control, you are missing the point of the Scriptures. Hear me say that. If you use the Bible and the words in this to control people, then you are misusing the words in here. And don't think you intend that. And that includes even me coming from the pulpit directed at you. That's not my point. This is not a book about leverage. It's a book about love. It's a book about love. I don't think I can say it any more plainly or clearly than that. Not only that, but if you are looking at it as leverage, then you tend to forget about the part where God forgave you. You know, the part that says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Book of Romans, chapter 8. You see, Christ didn't wait until you were worthy. Christ didn't wait until you had earned your salvation. Christ didn't wait until you got to this supposed level of self-piety before he said, okay, now Scott's good enough that I can send my son down for him. No, no, no. While you were still sinners, Christ died for us. Guys, I don't know if you realize this or not, but sin cannot be in the presence of God. They can't coexist. They cannot be together. God and sin cannot be in the same room. Just like dark and light can't be together. So while you were still living in sin and unapproachable to God, you were still dirty, you were still nasty, you were still caught in the mud, right? That's when God sent Christ to you. 
Not because of who you were, but because of who he is. If you truly believe what I just said, how can you possibly believe that as a husband, your wife should submit to your every whim and desire? I don't think you fully recognize the depth of which Christ saved you from, if that's the case. And then if that also is the case, I would ask how you treat your slaves. Because that's what verse 22 says. Obey your earthly masters in everything, slaves. And I'm pretty sure nobody in here has got slaves right now. I think I'm right. You're like, Scott, you're getting a little touchy here. We're not going to respond to you as much this morning. That's okay. Oh, children don't count, by the way. Just throwing that out there. I wrote that great comment down my notes. I can't miss it, right? Do you live your life as though living it in service to the Lord? Do you treat others as is fitting in the Lord? You see, Paul writes in verse 23 that whatever we do, we should work at it with all of our hearts as though serving the Lord, working to the Lord, not for men. It's really just a reiteration of the greatest commandment, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Do we really apply this principle only to our physical labor? Because it's easy to look at that passage and look at that verse and go, work at it with all your heart. Well, I work at it with all my heart, you know? I'm out there working with my hands. I'm out there working in my office. I'm doing it with all my heart. And then we let that at work. We let that principle stand alone by itself. And when we go home, it doesn't really apply to us. It's not just about our physical labor. What about your mental and emotional labor as well? Do you believe that that's somehow exempted from this equation? You see, this question is not only posed to the men in the sanctuary today. This posed to the women as well. You're not exempt from this concept. Men, treat your wives lovingly. Do not be harsh with them. Lift them up. Love them. Treat them as the angels that we believed them to be when we married them and that they can be and are most of the time. I'll tell you the truth. Everything good in our marriage comes not from me. It's from the angel God sent me. Lift up your wives. But women, you are not exempt from this process. You are not exempt from it. If your husband frustrates you, let him know about it, right? Badger him until he gets the point. Continue to bring it up over and over and over again so that he understands his shortcomings. And make sure you remind him of everything he messed up in the past when he let you down and never let him forget about it. Belittle, demean, and berate him both in public and in private. Is that what it says? It's okay, right? Because verse, verse 18 is only, only, verse 18 and 19 are only directed at certain groups, right? And it just says here that husbands love your wives and do not be harsh with them. You see, this whole passage is about living a holy life. You can't separate it out. It, it wasn't meant to stand alone. It wasn't meant to just say, wives submit to your husbands, period. And husbands love your wives, period. It wasn't meant to stand alone. It's about living a holy life. The first 17 verses of chapter 3 that we studied before today are rules for holy living, mostly communal, communal and congregational. What we're talking about today is a family life, a structure that exists within a household. It's interesting that verse... Chapter 4, verse 1 is actually key to understanding this entire passage. It says, Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. It's not, we can't just say, okay, well, we don't have any slaves. We're good to go here. We can ignore that verse. All right? Do what is right and fair because that's how your heavenly Father treated you. And I mentioned it earlier. I would offer that God did not treat us in a way that is right and fair. If he treated us in a way that was right and fair, he would have never sent his son, Christ, to die for our sins. Wouldn't have happened. We didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. If you truly understand how God treated you when you didn't deserve it, you cannot help but be moved in your heart and your soul for then how you treat others in return. 
When you realize the depths of your depravity, it minimizes others' depravity. It doesn't exemplify it. When you realize the depths from which you are saved, you can then go forth and live the life that Christ intended you to live. Listen, James chapter 2, verse 5. Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in the faith, to inherit the kingdom promised to those who love him? Translation, guess what? If you're a follower of Christ, you are least among men. People don't really like you a whole lot. You will be despised, persecuted, things of that nature. That's what Christ said. James just reiterates it. Paul writes this in Romans chapter 7. What a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You are not special or worthy because of who you think you are. You are not special because of your looks, because of your physical attributes, because of any abilities or personal characteristics or qualities that you have. You are worthy and you are special because you are loved. You are a child of the living God who made you, created you, but more importantly than anything, redeemed you through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And I know that sounds really churchy, doesn't it? But it's the truth. It's the truth. All you have to do is accept it. Live in that love. Choose to follow Christ. When you do that, guess what? It changes your perspective. You can then begin to treat others in humility, knowing that you have been extended that grace by God in your life as well. You see, Paul says this in this passage. He says, we will receive inheritance from the Lord in eternity for the things that we do here and now. You receive an inheritance in eternity for the things that you do now. That's what Paul writes. That's what we believe in these scriptures. Not just for how we work in a physical manner in our lives, but for how we live in the grace that we have been shown and how we then extend that grace to others. I played two sports when I was in high school. I played football and I played volleyball. Two different coaches. And these guys were somewhat polar opposite from each other. My football coach looked like a football coach. Like he was awesome, Coach Yo. I mean, he was, he was, he was, he was a brick. I mean, a guy was like 60 years old when I had him in high school and he was still jacked. He was like he was cut out of a piece of granite. And we used to joke that, that he played before they had face masks because his nose was kind of flat, so that was from taking all the hits without the leather, with the leather helmet on and stuff like that. And Coach Yo was great. I loved him. And I had another coach for volleyball, Coach Straight. Coach Straight didn't look the part. Coach Straight didn't fit the bill. I mean, if you look at Coach Straight, you just said, there's no way this guy knows a whole lot about volleyball. And I, I'd watch him in practice play volleyball, and I'm like, man, I don't get it. Like, he's not even that good. How can he know that much? Now I understand. I'm in my 40s, and I try and do things with volleyball. I'm like, okay, the body breaks down. I get it now, right? Two different coaches, both of them very successful coaches in their sport, incredibly successful coaches in their sport. You know what I remember about my coaches? I remember how my coaches treated me. You see, one coach treated me with respect. One coach challenged me and pushed me to be the best of my abilities. He didn't challenge me and push me to be better than, you know, the guy on my team, Kevin McCarty, who was great ahead of me, who was six foot five and 285 pounds and got a full ride to Villanova. He challenged me to do the best. I'll never forget, when, 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 I, when I picked out my number for that sport, I picked the number of the guy who just graduated, who was really good, and I said, I want that number. And he looked at me and said, Scott, why do you want that number? I said, because this guy just graduated and he's really good. He said, don't take a number from somebody because they were great. I'll never forget. He goes, he goes, don't take a number from somebody else because they were great. He said, take a number and make it great so that other people want your number. I was like, man, that's good. And, and that coach respected me. And he pushed me to be the best I can be. And I remember the lessons he taught me, and I respect him immensely. One of my other coaches, one of these two guys, didn't. I was never good enough. Didn't matter what I did. As soon as I made a mistake, I was off. I was out of the game. If I wasn't one of the chosen one, if I wasn't one of the, the really good guys, if I wasn't one of the great players, no matter how much I pushed myself, it was never enough. It wasn't enough to live up to my abilities. I had to live up to other people's abilities. 
which is never going to happen. I never felt loved. I never felt respected. I felt demeaned at times. In fact, when I showed up for the first day of practice, I was questioned about my weight. Well, you should have done this last year. Then you'd been a lot further ahead where you are this year. Very disappointing. What was fascinating to me is one of these sports I was really good at and I was very gifted at. The other sport I wasn't very good at and I wasn't very gifted at. Because of the belief in my coach, I ended up not liking the sport I was gifted at and excelling in the sport that I wasn't. All because of how they treated me. And much of it was according to the scripture that we're looking at today. What are you cultivating in your relationships with those around you? Especially with your family and especially with your loved ones. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you uh, just for this time to be together. And more than anything, I pray that our interpretation of your scripture would be true to your intended purpose of it. God, may your spirit speak to us in our hearts. Work within us, change us, shape us, mold us. Just, just, just do your thing and help us to get out of the way. May we seek after your son Christ and may all the blocks fall into places otherwise in our lives. And God, may it never be about us. May it always be about you. We thank you for your son. We thank you for your love, both at the times when we feel like we deserve it and the times that we don't. Because we are never worthy of it. And yet you choose to give it anyway. Work in our hearts and minds. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.